Chapter 25 The Society of Satan Genesis 11, 1-9 And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confine their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of the city called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 11, 1-9 Man is inescapably religious. He may deny God, but all the categories of his life remain religious, and all are categories borrowed from the triune God, since the only world man lives in is the world created by his thinking, even in apostasy, is inevitably conditioned and governed by a God-given framework. Men may deny God's sovereignty, but they cannot stop believing in sovereignty. They merely transfer it to man or to the state. Total law and planning, that is, predestination, is inescapable. Denied to God, it is simply transferred to the scientific socialist state which predestines or totally governs and plans all things. If deity be denied to the God of Scripture, it merely reappears in man or the state. And if the church ceases proclaiming the gospel, then religion does not perish, it reappears as politics or economics, and salvation continues to be offered to inescapably religious man. Salvation is a necessity of man's being, and the goal of salvation is new life and freedom. If salvation be not accepted in God through Christ, then it is accepted in man or in an order of man such as the state. From the beginning of history, God instituted a holy society, a city of God, indicating its foundations in the institution of sacrifice by calling the line of Seth, Noah, Shem and Abraham, instituting the law of Moses and confirming the covenant in Christ. But another society has been in history from the beginning also, the society of Satan, whose foundation was stated by the tempter to Eve, manifested in the fall, proclaimed at Babel, continuing long as mankind's secret church and increasingly manifested openly. Let us examine two important passages of Scripture with reference to this society, Genesis 3, 7-17, in its main outlines, is simplicity itself. Confronted by God, Adam and Eve seek refuge in a feeble covering for their guilt and shame. The Hebrew word for cover, kafar, is also the word for atonement. Atonement is thus a covering for sin, and it can be an evasive covering or the covering provided by God. It can be self-righteousness or the righteousness of God in Christ. Man constantly seeks a covering for his guilt and shame in institutional facades, and one of the most popular of hiding places from God is the institutional church. Cultural anthropologists have divided societies in terms of guilt and shame cultures and with reason. We can add that man seeks in institutional structures an apron or covering for his sin and the deeper the guilt and shame, the greater the structural development. Atonement as basic to institutional and especially civil structures is an important fact of man's history. 
citizenship was once a religious act and politics rested on atonement. The Greek polis was a religious entity and modern politics has no less a religious frame of reference in that it is still concerned with neutralizing sin and evil by means of institutional structures. Sinful men, united by the state, are expected to create a good society, that is, a good omelette out of bad eggs. The United Nations, that modern Tower of Babel, is the epitome of this faith. Man's basic and original sin is, quote, to be as God, knowing good and evil, end quote. Knowing here has the force of determining, establishing, so that man's essential sin is to attempt to play God and to legislate creatively and substantively on the nature of morality in terms of his own Godhead. Man seeking to be God became less the man Adam's response to God's question is to evade responsibility. It's the woman's fault, he says in effect. Poor innocent man that I am, how could I resist the woman's wiles? In my innocence I have been led astray. More than that, the fault is yours, God, for giving me the woman. Quote, the woman thou gavest me, end quote. Had you not given me her, I would not have sinned. Eve is no less evasive of responsibility. Poor innocent woman that I am, how could I withstand the serpent's guile? Not for all the world would she deliberately have done wrong. The guilt lies elsewhere. Guilt is thus transferred. It is projected on the environment, made part of the ultimate frame of things, passed on to others, evaded by transference and projection. Guilt is denied to the individual in the name of social and natural forces. Concretely, juvenile delinquency is blamed on the parents, the home, or the environment. And it is commonplace for judges, with a smattering of psychiatry and welfare theory at their command, to excoriate already burdened parents with a fearful burden of misplaced guilt. Again, crime is blamed on the environment, on heredity, on any number of natural and social forces, so that, as Henry Miller has put it, punishment is criminal. The guilt is societies, and especially somehow the non-criminals for having fostered this tragic chain of reactions we call crime. Let the, quote, good men, end quote, pay the price, therefore, and let the have nations pay off the have-nots for the affront of their success and affluence. Our foreign aid programme is premised on an anti-Christian theology in which failure is rewarded and success penalised. Its essence is hostile to missions and charity which speak of mercy and offer regeneration on the assumption that a godly reordering is required. The Negro problem gives us a similar picture. The Christian cannot consistently believe in either racism or equality. God has made of one blood all nations, we are clearly told, and all are descendants of Adam. On the other hand, Equality is a non-biblical concept imported from mathematics into human relationships where both equality and inequality are inappropriate concepts. The biblical concept is calling and in orientation it is not democratic but divisive. Dewey was right. In a common faith, in calling Christianity's basic division between heaven and hell, saved and lost, sheep and goats, anti-democratic, quote, I cannot understand how any realisation of the democratic ideal as a vital moral and spiritual ideal in human affairs is possible without surrender of the conception of the basic division to which supernatural Christianity is committed, end quote. The implication of Dewey's position is clear-cut. Grading by God or man is anti-democratic, Moral and spiritual distinctions are by nature aristocratic. Exactly so. Our faith is clearly anti-democratic and holds to an aristocracy, not of works, not of blood inheritance, but of grace. 
And instead of a transference of guilt, it is the essence of biblical faith to confess it, declaring with David that sin is primarily and essentially an offence against God, against thee. Thee only have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight. Since every fact is a created fact, then every fact is a God-given factuality, a totally personal universe. The society or city of God is thus marked by a radically different approach to every fact in all creation. Another society was offered to man and introduced into history by the fall, a society again proffered to man in its fullness by Satan in the wilderness temptation of Christ. What is the nature of this society of Satan? First, it is held that man is not guilty of his sin, not responsible for his lawlessness, for the sources of his guilt are not personal, but social and natural. In the ultimate sense, the guilt is God's for having dared to create so difficult a cosmos, and God, as well as God's people, must be made to pay for this cosmic insolence. Second, a society is demanded in which it is unnecessary for man to be good, Everything is to be provided so that man might attain true blessedness, a problem-free life. The Beatitudes in pronouncing a blessing on suffering, persecution, tears and trials for Christ's sake are thus the epitome of perversion. A good God must make it unnecessary for men to be good and having failed to do so, the good state, the true welfare state, must now make it unnecessary for man to be tested, unnecessary for man to be good. Man has all rights and no responsibilities. The duties are God's who has failed in his duty to man. Third, a society is demanded in which it is impossible for men to be bad. This is the logical concomitant of the second demand. It is a demand that there be no testing. How cruel of God to test Adam and to test us. The world must be trouble-free and test-free. The goal of most politics and sociology is to provide us with such a world. Is anyone bad? Let this fact be concealed from him and the world be so ordered that self-knowledge never comes out. And because every man is God in his own eyes and God in terms of this sociology of Satan then every man must be preserved from any testing that might shatter this illusion. Let politics and social planning operate on the premise of human omnipotence. Thus, there are no insoluble problems. Man shall conquer all things, the cosmos and death included. Let no testing shatter his delusions of grandeur. Fourth, a society is demanded in which it is impossible for men to feel there must be no failure in heaven or on earth. All men must be saved. All students must pass. All men are employable. All men are entitled to all rights. As Satan stated it baldly in the wilderness, giving in short form the program for the, quote, good, end quote, state, quote, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread, end quote, make it unnecessary for man to work, unnecessary for man to be good, impossible for man to be bad. Provide man with such a cushion of social planning, the tempter asserted, that man might neither hunger nor thirst, work or suffer, believe or disbelieve, succeed or fail, be good or evil. Let his every need be met and his world be ordered in terms of his wishes. Let it be a trouble-free world, cradle to grave security. Let there be no failure. No failure is tolerable and none is recognised save one, God's for having dared to create a world in which we can suffer for our sins, in which we can be tried and tested, in which we can be good or evil, in which we can and must be men. Let us through communism. Socialism or our welfare states construct a world better than God's, a world in which failure is impossible and man is beyond good and evil. 
The result of Adam's fall was thus the birth of sociology, of religions and politics which seek to create this society of Satan, the city of man. Against all this, the truth remains that man is created in the image of God, has fallen, is a sinner, and can never escape the fact except by means of regeneration and sanctification in Jesus Christ, except by becoming a member of him and of his new humanity, a new, responsible man, a citizen of the kingdom of God. In whose image are we trying to remake ourselves, our children and our society? In God's image through Jesus Christ? Or in the image of man as proposed by Satan? Satan? 